You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the map because tonight we want to end up in this little place up here, which is in Greece, in Macedonia, called Philippi. Now, Paul, when we, when we read this chapter in Acts 16, Paul is on a journey and he's coming up through this part of the world here, which we would call Turkey, and he, it was called Asia at the time. He's coming up through here and he wants to go up around here and do some preaching of the gospel up around here, but he found that the Holy Spirit prevented him from going to that part of the world and he didn't understand why but it frustrated him in some way. And then one night, in a vision, in a dream, Paul sees a man from Macedonia, a man who was obviously identified as Greek, that Paul could identify as a Greek, and this man said to Paul in a dream, come to Macedonia and help us. And he knew that that dream was from God, so he immediately made preparations to leave this area of Turkey here, and he came across here and made his way up to Neopolis, and then up to the city of Philippi, because Philippi was was the chief city in the area of Macedonia. Now, Philippi was what they call a colony. Now, I don't know heaps about this, except for the fact that if you lived in a colony of Rome, you enjoyed all of the rights in that colony that you would have experienced in Rome, which was the capital of the world at the time. So over here in Philippi, In this beautiful part of of the world, I'm assuming it's beautiful because it seems that lots of retired army generals or lots of army chiefs and Roman officials made their way there and retired there because they kept all the privileges as if they had been in Rome, but they got to live somewhere that was obviously nicer. So it'd be like Victor Harbour maybe, you know, like a beautiful place on the coast where you would enjoy all the privileges of living in Adelaide, but you're by the seaside. Let's let's imagine it like that. Maybe that's what Philippi was like. Victor Harbour. So this is where Paul makes his way to. And this is where we find in verse um, verse 12 of the chapter we read tonight, he came to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony... And they were in that city abiding certain days. So they stayed in this city for some time. Now, does anyone remember from from the lessons, and feel free to answer this question, anyone who wants to, does anyone remember what the first thing that Paul did or what, what was the first place he went to when he got to a city, usually? Jaden? Right, he went to the synagogue. And why did he go to the synagogue? Yeah? There wasn't a synagogue. Is that true? How did... How do you know? Right. He's got it right. He's got there ahead of me. So he would usually go to a synagogue to preach in the synagogue to the Jewish people in the place where he went. But, as A.B. has accurately said, in this, in, this, in this city, after he'd been in the city several days, and verse 13, on the Sabbath day, which would be the day he would usually go to the synagogue, he goes out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made and we sat down and spoke to the women that were there. So he goes and he he goes looking for people to talk to about the gospel and he finds a group of women on the riverside who are willing to have a chat about the gospel. People who went there for prayer. So they're obviously of some spiritual persuasion. They had some connection with God. We don't know what that was at the time. But they were people who were believers in a message and a, and a believers in God. And Paul decided to speak to them. And one of the people who was in this city, I'm just going to spin this around now, so we'll have to go away from the map. We'll bring the map back later. It was a lady called Lydia. And it tells us in this chapter here, it tells us up in verse 14, that she was a seller of purple, she worshipped God, and that God um, had opened her heart and she attended to the things that were spoken by Paul. So this lady was a seller of purple.
and she believed in God. Now, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, purple dye was quite hard to come by in, the, in these days because the way that purple dye was made was they got these little sea snails out of the sea and I think they're quite small and you had to get a lot of them and you crushed them and with the juices from the snails you made the purple dye. So it was a very labour intensive method of getting a colour for material. And that meant, because it was so labour intensive, that it cost a lot of money to buy. So whether you were buying the dye or whether you were buying the material dyed that purple colour, you had to be quite wealthy to afford it. So this lady ran a business, either selling the dye itself or the, or the material that was purple, but she was dealing with wealthy customers, royalty possibly, people of, people of like very high standing within the community at Philippi. They were the sorts of people that this, this woman Lydia was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and she was providing them with this rare purple dye or this rare purple material for their garments. And she was quite used to dealing with them and running this business. And she believed in God. Now, when she heard the message of the gospel that Paul taught her, she believed not only her, but her whole household. And they became part of that first group of people that were baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in Philippi. Lydia and her house. And then, if you look at the end of verse 15, after she was baptised in all of her household... She says to Paul and Silas, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained them. So she goes and she shows, goes out of her way to show hospitality to Paul and Silas and to invite them into her house. Now, Paul obviously is going to continue here for a while. He's got a good basis on which to now continue to take that gospel message all through that area of Greece. And he goes often to the riverside to meet with people who go there to pray. When we come to verse 16, as they went to prayer, a certain damsel or a lady possessed with a spirit of divination met them and she brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And I think the version that Mike read tonight said fortune telling. So there was a lady possessed with, actually, um, if you look at that word divination, it says the spirit of Python. Okay, now in Greek mythology, Python was a massive snake, which that, that equates to what we know about serpent, <laughs> pythons today. Python was a massive snake that had a fight with the Greek god Apollo, and the Greek god Apollo managed to win the battle and kill the snake, but the spirit of the snake lived on and then infected people and caused them to act in a way that was abnormal to, to what we'd normally expect them to act. So this woman, supposed to be able to tell fortunes because she was possessed with the spirit of Python. Now, oddly enough, um, she, the words that this lady went on to say about Paul and Silas were actually accurate. And that's the really interesting part, that, that, that this lady was able to identify through this difficulty that she had, because in verse 17, when she followed Paul, she cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show to us the way of salvation. Now, this lady had a mental illness. That's what it really was. And yet through that mental illness, she was able to accurately describe the reason that Paul and Silas were in that city. And yet there was a snag. Because of this lady's mental illness and her supposed ability to tell the future, she had masters which used her as a slave and they charged people to tell their fortune. And so the money that they received went straight to them and it says that she brought them much gain. So they were able to charge a lot of money for the services of this lady to telling people's fortunes. Now, because she was associated with that and because she was associated with this abnormal behaviour, even though the words that she said were accurate, Paul did not like the fact that what she was saying was associated with this 
this spirit of Python that possessed it, this Greek mythology, these foreign gods. He did not like that. And so as she persisted with this day after day, he turned around in verse 18. He was grieved. I think Paul was grieved because of the, what, what, what her message was being associated with. And she, he was grieved with the way that her masters were using her to make money out of, out of saying that they could tell the future. And Paul turns to her and said to this spirit of Python, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So he says to her, look, be healed. And through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this woman was restored to her right mind and this this supposed spirit of Python stopped afflicting this poor lady. But of course, she then immediately stops telling people's fortunes. And the income that these two men or that this group of men called her masters had was immediately taken away. It was dried up. You see in verse 19, when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and they drew them into the marketplace before the rulers or the magistrates. Now, they had to be careful what they said, these men, and they they must have thought about this reasonably well because they couldn't say that... Paul and Silas had hurt this lady. In fact, quite the opposite was true. She was now in her right mind and perfectly capable of acting normally now that she was not possessed by this mental illness. So they came up with charges that they thought would resonate with the magistrates and resonate with the people of this city full of retired Roman officials. And those charges that they made up were... In verse 20, that these men were Jews, that they troubled the city, and in verse 21, they taught customs which were not lawful to receive nor observe being Romans. Now, the response of the magistrates is quite cavalier. I I don't understand entirely why they acted this way, because when you look at later chapters of Acts, the Romans were very, very careful that other Roman citizens should be given a fair and reasonable trial. Towards the end of, end of Acts, the governors are very, very clear that they want to hear both sides of the story and they want to have charges that are able to be proved before they send a Roman citizen for punishment. But here in this thing, the magistrates seem to leap out of their chairs, they, they rip off their clothes, and then they hand these two men over to the people who were responsible for administering punishment, and they got out the sticks and they beat Paul and Silas there in front of them with large sticks. Now, it seems quite an unreasonable response to healing a young girl from a mental illness. And we don't exactly know why that was, but that's what they did. And then they they said they commanded Paul and Silas to be taken and given to the jailer, and they said to the jailer, make sure that these men are held fast and they do not escape. So the jailer, being the good Roman citizen that he was, he took them and he locked them right in the most inner dungeon cell and to make sure that they couldn't escape, he locked them in stocks. Now, you know what stocks are? Everyone know what stocks are? They're, yeah? Things that your feet go in. Things that your feet go in, right? That's right. Big planks, two planks of wood with holes in them, but not big enough to get your feet back through, Okay. So they put their feet in, they slam them down, they lock them shut, and then they're trapped in there. They can't go anywhere. Now, what would happen, I know these men were actually in the jail cell, but what would happen if you were put in stocks in a public square? Do you remember what would happen with that? Yeah? You'd get mouldy fruit thrown at you, that's right. So if you were put in stocks in the town square then you would be humiliated by having mouldy fruit thrown at you. Well, I don't think that happened here because they were shut in the, in the deepest cell in the prison and they were, they were made fast by this jailer. Now, his job was to keep them safe. The funny thing is that when we come and read verse 25, and this is where we really start to get into this story, This is the important part of the story. In verse 25, 
after these men had been beaten with rods, many times it says, and they were given to a jailer who threw them into the middle of the jail and locked them in stocks. In that pain and in that horrible situation, Paul and Silas, in their helpless state, turned to God. And they turned to God in two ways. The first way was that they began to pray together. That's verse 25 there. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. And the second thing that they did is that they sung praises to God. Now, if the magistrates had acted in an unreasonable and a most odd manner, then these two men had taken that even further and were acting in a most even more unreasonable and an even more odd manner to what you would expect naturally. They prayed and they sang praises to God to strengthen themselves and to encourage themselves in this really difficult time and the prisoners around them heard what they were doing. And that's the key there. The prisoners around them heard what they were doing and wondered at these two crazy men, what on earth were they doing? And we're not told why they did it at all. We're not told why they did it at all, except for the fact that they drew strength from that because God had put them in that situation, so he must have wanted them there for a reason. And they knew that. Have a look what happens in verse 26 as a direct result of their prayers and their praises to God. There was a great earthquake that shook the foundations of the prison. It caused all the prison doors to spring open and it made everybody's chains and stocks open up so that in one instant, at midnight, in the dark, all of the prisoners were free. Now, I know what I'd do in this instant. I would have said, that's an answer to my prayer and back in early Acts, if you can think about the early classes of Acts, when Peter was in jail... The angel came along and took off his prison, um, his chains and opened the doors for him and Peter willingly followed that angel and they walked outside and the angel set him free. And I would have gone, that's God's answer to me, I'm out of here. And I would have been out of that prison in a flash. Paul doesn't. Paul stays in that prison and he manages to convince all of the other prisoners to stay in that prison too. Now, Paul and Silas were innocent of the crimes that they'd been accused. Most of the other people in that prison probably were not. There was probably some pretty hardy people in that prison. However, he managed to convince them all to stay in that prison. And what we find is that the keeper, in verse 27 of the prison, the jailer, he stumbles out of bed, And he sees the prison doors open and he must have had expected the prisoners to have the same thoughts that that I would have had. To get out of there as fast as he can. And when the jailer saw this, he drew out his sword and he attempted, or he, he was just about to kill himself. Now at this point, the jailer believed that his life had gone so badly wrong that dying by his own sword was preferable to staying alive. That's that's what the jailer believed, that there was no way out. And and this is where I want to stop and think think a moment because lots of people in their life get to this point. And they get to this point for two reasons. They feel like that they've lost control of their lives to start with, That's the first thing that they feel. And they feel, number two, that their life is beyond recovery. And when those two things combine, people get to the point where they feel like that it's better that they were to die than to still be alive. That they lose control of their lives and they feel like 
that they're beyond recovery, and they, and, they, and they sometimes want to, and they try to, and sometimes they're successful at ending their own lives. Now, what happened here was if Paul had run out of that jail with his fellow soldiers, with his fellow prisoners, sorry, thinking that it was an answer to God's prayer, that jailer most certainly would have died that night, and, and, and who knows how many other people. But in staying in that jail and convincing the other prisoners, Paul was able to offer this man just a sliver of hope to grab hold of. And he did so by offering these words to the man in verse 28 by saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. And it was just the briefest glimmer of hope that Paul threw out to this man to see if he could get a response. And those words stopped that man from doing what he was about to do. And he called for a light and he ran in and he fell down before Paul and Silas and he said those words that are our title tonight, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that action of Paul staying in that prison and just saying the right words at the right time stopped that man and saved the person's life. And that's incredible, isn't it? That's absolutely incredible. I I didn't intend to go to this verse, but I I want to take you back to a, um, a, a verse in Isaiah. Come back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 50. Because sometimes we think that it would be really nice to be able to read people's thoughts because we could know what to say to them at the right occasion. But in preparing for this class, I I had to think about that. I don't think if I could read people's thoughts, I would know what to say just magically like that. Knowing what to say to people, the right thing at the right time, starts like now, trying to do it, even if we mess it up. Trying to do that now. And here's here's why I think that even if I could read people's thoughts, I wouldn't say the right thing. It's Isaiah 50 and verse 4. It says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakens morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the learned. If there's a reason to study the Bible or read the Bible and have it as a daily influence in our life, it's so that when those opportunities arise, I can have the tongue of the learned to say what Paul said to save a person's life. That popped out at me on Sunday in a way that I'd never seen in in the exhort on Sunday. The reason to have the Bible in our life is so that you can cast those slithers of hope to people who might be all that they need to grab hold of it and say, and to, and to stop their course of destruction of their life, to turn a life around and save a life. That's why the Bible is such an amazing book. It might not always work. It might not work every time. But if there's an opportunity, I'd love to be able to take it. So come back into Acts chapter 16 again. Because this man springs in and he says those words... What must I do to be saved? And the response from the disciples could not have been more ready on the tips of their tongue. Uh, It's over in um, verse 31 of Acts chapter 16. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. They gave him the message of the gospel in the middle of a dingy jail in the middle of the night by candlelight. That's how that man was saved. And at that point there, he was convinced that he needed to change his life and he was willing to do so. He was willing to do so because he had been brought to a point where he realised that his life was hopeless. It, It held nothing. And he wanted something more than what he saw before him. He faced death on the brink of death 
and he was brought back from that. And that's incredible. So, they spoke to him in verse 32 about the word of the Lord and all that were in his house, and then he took them the same hour, he washed them, and they're bruised and bleeding backs, and he gives them food, and he rejoices, believing in God and all his house. I'm oh, sorry, I skipped a step there. Verse 33, he was baptised, he and all his household, straight away. So now, there is Lydia and all her household that form part of this group of believers, and now there is the jailer and all his household. And that could have amounted to quite a number of people, couldn't it, when you think about it? If there was extended families living together, if there, if there were... Um, you know, cousins living together or, or mothers and fathers and children. You don't know how many people it could have been, but it could have been quite a substantial number of people. And they taught him the gospel and they rejoiced. And Paul's actions saved this man's life now and gave him eternal life in the future as well. This man got his life back twice. And that's an incredible, from, from, from one small action... And one small sentence, they convinced this man to change his life. Now, the thing that changed this man's life, or the point of change, came about when he experienced something. And I want to talk about this for a little while now. When he experienced... When he experienced fear. I want to talk about fear for a little bit because fear is an incredible motivator in some cases of our life. Let's come back and have a look at two verses in Proverbs that talk about fear. So Proverbs chapter 9 is the first verse I want to look at tonight and verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10. And this verse says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if you go through the Bible, and I'm still, I'm still, I'm still collating this in my, in my head. I haven't got to the point where I've actually written it down anywhere. The number of faithful people who were brought to fear and trembling because of the circumstances of their life and that prompted change in their life is almost universal. Every person at some point in their life will go through fear and trembling. Because God has the ability to reach down in our lives and reach right into the darkest recesses of our lives and poke right on a raw nerve that we didn't even know that God knew about and just nudge it And he makes us fear and tremble. And that's a tool that God uses to get our attention. Let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 16. It doesn't say that God uses fear to save us. God uses fear to begin to save us. Now let's have a look at Proverbs 16. Because there's an incredible verse in Proverbs 16 verse 6. So fear... Oops is the beginning of wisdom. And that word beginning there is important. Now let's see how Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs explains it now in verse 6 of Proverbs chapter 16. And this verse, this verse you almost need to read the second half before the first half, right? So if you're reading New King James Version, I'm not sure, it, that, that, that's written in a way that doesn't make sense to me. The actual the um, the King James version I think puts it better. I couldn't understand what New King James was trying to get at with this one, but that's just listen to what it says. Proverbs sixteen verse six: By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Now, what does that say to me? That says, fear God uses fear to help men 
depart from evil. So if a man or a woman is going in a direction that is evil, God can stop them in their tracks and turn them around using fear if he chooses. It's a tool that God has got in his, in his, in his abilities to use. But then he purges sin by tender mercy and truth for the rest of that person's life. So that's why I think that that verse sometimes should be read the other way around because the start of that verse is actually the start of our journey with God or the turning of us around. The first part of that verse is how God continues to work with us for the rest of our life. And what we find out of these two verses is that fear is a tool that God uses sometimes when he wants to speak to us, when he wants to start to have a conversation with us. And sometimes he uses it especially when we're not listening very well to him and he gets our attention just briefly. And then once we start listening, then we begin to learn the wisdom of God and he then speaks to us softly again. It's almost like as a parent, when you want to snap your child out of something and you say, Ollie, are you listening to me? That's what it's like. That's how I imagine those verses work together. It gets our attention and then he continues to work with us patiently and lovingly. And he does so because he wants to start a conversation with us. And when we feel fear, we have two choices. We can let the fear become despair so that we feel like that we want to take the sword like the jailer and end our life. Or we can look at our fear and we can look it deep in the eyes and we can realise that our fear has been brought upon us by a loving father who wants to start a conversation with us and when we look past that fear, we realise that the source of our fear and the source of our salvation is the one source. And that's why perfect love casts out fear because when we realise that the source of our fears is God himself and the source of our salvation is God himself and we realise that the fear was there to bring us to the source of salvation, then we can overcome our fears. And sometimes we have to have courage to look our God deep in the eyes, to look those fears deep in the eyes, to see that that is what, what, what for, see it for what it is. And then there's only one question that should follow that. When we look our God deep in the eyes, what must I do to be saved? Because that's what follows the beginning it's what must I do to be saved? And like, like the jailer, our fear can then become our faith. And that leads us into a relationship with our God. Now, you know, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because back in Acts chapter 16, we had another group of people that experienced fear. And that was the magistrates who came to tell Paul and Silas that they could go out of that jail free the next morning. So back in Acts chapter 16 and verse 35, when it was day, the magistrates, the ones who had ripped their clothes off and commanded these men to be beaten, they sent some subordinates, some surgeons to the jail saying, go go and tell the jailer, let these people go in. We probably shouldn't have done that. (laughs) And the keeper of the prison, he then told this to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, you've beaten us openly, uncondemned. We're Roman citizens. You've cast us into prison. And now you're just going to sort of lift up the carpet and sweep it underneath? No. Let them come and fetch them out themselves. And the sergeants told these words to the magistrates and they feared. They feared because they'd done illegal things and held illegal trials and beaten two innocent men illegally in front of the whole city against Roman law. And that carried serious consequences for these men. And they feared. What did they do? Well... They came down and they said to Paul and Silas, look, we know it's an awkward situation, but could you go away and just make it 
just make everything go away. They were, they were not courageous enough, like the jailer, to look their fear in the eyes and ask, what must we do to be saved? They just wanted it to go away. They didn't, Paul made them feel uncomfortable. And instead of facing those fears and realising that God was the one who could save, they took the message of salvation and they just said, can, can you take it away, Paul? We don't want to hear about it anymore. It makes us feel awkward. And so they were not saved. So there's this contrast of two groups of people with fears, isn't there? One was saved and one was not saved. And I guess, in conclusion, the lesson that we want to take out of this tonight is if you've reached a point where you've asked something like this in your life, if you've said the words, what's the point of life? If you've asked the words, well, what's there to live for anymore? And if you've asked the words, what is the purpose of existing in this world, given the state that it's in, then maybe like the jailer, you're standing there with the sword in your hand, ready to end your life. Maybe that's where you've got to. But then like the jailer, just ask one more question. And that's the theme for tonight. What must I do to be saved? Because the answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at bt f at cdvideo.org If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.